and he's written eight books, is that correct? Most recently, The Table Comes First. Um, so I'm not going to take up any more time. We're going to have Adam talk about the movie. Thank you all for coming around tonight. I hardly need a microphone, but it's, I'm so glad we'll be able to watch this together. Um, I don't know if Double Indemnity is my absolute favorite movie. It would probably buy with uh, City Lights and a Fred Astaire musical for that role. But it's certainly, I think, the key film noir. And if there's a favorite genre that I love in movies, it's film noir. And that's a little weird, I know. And a couple of people in the office, when they heard I was doing this tonight, said, you know, your work is not really very noirish. And it's true. That's not the kind of thing that I write. But I'm totally drawn to the genre. So I just thought I would say quickly, before this great movie starts, a few things about why that is. Film noir, as I'm sure many of you know, is just the French for black film. And it was a term that was coined by Nino Frank, a French film critic, in 1946, right in the middle of its uh, highest renaissance, the moment when it was most flourishing. And it refers to a whole genre of films made in Hollywood, essentially, uh, in the 1940s and early 1950s, from about 1944 to 1955. And there are lots of people who argue that there are great instances from 1962, and that there are neo-noir films and British noir and so on, and all of that's true. But essentially, the core uh, uh, achievement was a, an American achievement in those 10 years. And it involves always films uh, that have a slightly melodramatic cast, a thriller, a mystery of some sort. But what is, appropriately, the core thing about them is their darkness of tone. They're not, though they may be highly moralistic, in lots of ways, involving as double indemnity is involving a fairly clear distribution of responsibility and guilt. Nonetheless, their tone is not that of a detective film or of an FBI film, where bad guys are clearly bad and good guys are clearly good, and the bad guys get punished and the good guys prevail. They're much more mysterious, complicated, and ambiguous than that, as you see it in double indemnity. Um, when I ask myself why it is that I'm so drawn to this genre, and whenever my wife is out of town, all I do is try and get my friend Richard Brody, who is the New Yorker's film rabbi, to recommend another 10 film noir to watch. The more obscure, the better, from Uncrazy and Detour to Ancient Face and Nightfall. Uh, I think that, as I brooded on, I think it's something essentially simple. That is that the material uh, from which a film noir are drawn tend to all be from what we think of as American hard-boiled fiction. Uh, James N. Cain, Raymond Chandler, other Philip Marlowe books. In fact, one of the things that makes Double Indemnity fascinating is that it's really on the literary, on the written end, it's a collaboration between James N. Cain and Raymond Chandler. I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, all of those kinds of writers who we think of as hard-boiled, even pulp writers, leading up to a true pulp writer, Nicholas Spillane, who's the author of one of the last great, uh, one of the last great noir, uh, *Kiss Me Deadly*. They're all um, that is that genre, and yet it's that particular kind of American hard-boiled, minimal, brutal, brutalist sensibility. Almost always, in the best cases, filtered through a European sensibility. Almost all the greatest Mars, not all, any generalization of that kind of fault, but so many of them were made by emigrant Europeans as double indemnity was made by Billy Wilder. And they were all coming out of that uh, moment, that movement in European film that we describe as expressionist, German expressionist, European expressionist. And whenever I brood on why film noir casts this extraordinary spell, a stronger spell for me than either hard-boiled fiction, which for me is a genre a style, or European Expressionism, which is still very much, for me, a period style. Why these movies live, it's exactly because that kind of hard-boiled American realism is passed through the prism of European Expressionism. So you get something that's simultaneously absolutely brutally real, but that has some of the atmospherics, some of the mystery, some of the enigma of a dream. Uh, and that, I think, is the deep appeal of film noir. They tell us fables and stories that are rooted in the gritty reality of our ambiguous lives, but they have the kind of disconnected, feverish, irresistible quality of dream. And that, I think, is true about the double identity. It's certainly fascinating that, as I say, almost all the greatest film noir makers, uh, Lang, and Preminger, Edgar Ulmer, a less known name, who made the great detour, uh, Jacques Tourneur, the um, Franco-American writer who made out of the past, a filmmaker who made out of the past, 
are either European or they were filmmakers like Orson Welles and Jules de Sand who were very much at home in New York, or um, John Huston as well. So I, for me, the appeal of film noir, and never more than the, perhaps its first masterpiece, Double Indemnity, are is that the morals of American realism are expressed with the manners of European expressions. Um, there are always, it seems to me, and another thing that fascinates me about film noir is that, like Shakespeare's plays in a way, they come very close to the edge always of fable and myth, with very predictable uh, uh, kinds of casts and repertoires of characters, which nonetheless don't seem to us stilted or dead, but somehow seem alive, and they occupy that fascinating ground between fable and realist fiction. There is almost always a protagonist, and never better than in this film, who is a flawed or broken man. Someone who is not in himself evil, but is unable to resist temptation. There is almost always a femme fatale of some kind, a woman who represents temptation and is herself often unable to resist it. But then, interestingly, and never more potently than in Double Indemnity, there's almost always a third figure, a man of sense, a man of conscience, who kind of haunts the edges of the film and plays a central role. Some of you may remember that in 17th century French comedy, Molière, for instance, there's always one figure who's the man of sense, who's up against the hypocrites or the misanthropes, uh, and he plays the role of sort of the central consciousness. And that's often true in film noir. It's true in Jacques Tourneau's Nightfall, for instance. And the greatest instance of that is in this film, is in Edgar G. Robinson's portrayal of Walter Ness, the Frederick Murray's character, best friend, who's also the observer, the watcher, and in a sense, the conscience of the whole film. Specifically about Double Indemnity, it begins, as I'm sure all of you know, as a serial and then a novel by James M. Cain, the writer, weird little um, intramural note. James M. Cain was, for a brief period of time, the managing editor of The New Yorker in the early 1930s. Um, Harold Ross, the first editor of The New Yorker, was famous, as Tina Brown would later be, for his Jesuses. That is his conviction that every few weeks he would find the one person who could really run the magazine. And he would hire someone to really run the magazine, because running a weekly magazine is difficult. That person would fail, and then they would be hired, and the next Jesus would would be hired. James M. Cain was one of those Jesuses, and he worked as the managing editor of New Yorker for a while. He found that he had better and more characteristic things to do, and he began to write that first great string of hard-boiled uh, crime fiction, double indemnity, post finales with his and so on. Not his fuss, I should say, and so on. Um, so it's a Cain story that everyone regarded as unfilmable because it's so dark, it's so much about murder, betrayal. It's based roughly the story on the famous Snyder Gray murders of the 1920s when a suburban woman really did talk her boyfriend into murdering her husband. Double indemnity, I didn't know this, by the way, until I was getting ready to come to you tonight. It's the sort of question that you should ask yourself and you never do. Uh, double indemnity refers to a feature of life insurance policies of the time. If you were killed, if a, uh, you had a normal life insurance policy, if you died accidentally, obviously, you would need uh, double indemnity, twice the payout, in order to provide for your family, because you would have died unexpectedly in the amount of money the family would need. It all sounds very wholesome and virtuous, but obviously it was an instant temptation to murder and to filmmaking. Uh, that's part, that's where the double indemnity refers to. Uh, Billy Wilder, a uh, great uh, Viennese German filmmaker uh, in America who had worked with Lubitsch, thought that he could make something of it. Wilder, in a certain sense, was working his way out of comedy, but he never abandoned comedy in any way. He did a draft of it with his collaborator, Charles Brackett, who didn't really work, Brackett was wrong for it, and he turned to the other great hard-boiled realist writer to help him, and that is Raymond Chandler. Uh, Chandler, of course, is the author of Marlowe books, and he came in as the screenwriter. They fought, they had a very difficult collaboration, uh, 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 Billy Wilder believed that writing should be difficult, even more difficult than it is natural. And he banged heads with Chandler, who wanted just to kind of turn something out in a kind of act like way and try to just make it pass. And uh, uh, Billy Wilder convinced him that he had to do it right. And as a reward for doing it right, Chandler has a tiny cameo about five minutes into the movie, if you look carefully, when Fred McMurray walks down an aisle to see a man look up, and that is Raymond Chandler. Chandler, a fascinating character in his own right, British author, as I'm sure many of you know, 
a contemporary of Peachy Woodhouse at Dulwich College in England, and with Woodhouse, one of the two great masters of, I guess we could call it the Baroque pop vernacular. Uh, they found ways to solve the basic problems with the movie, which were how we're we going to tell a story about adultery and murder uh, within the constraints of the production code of 1944. They found it in part by writing a very horrible death chamber scene from the end of the film in which Walter Neff, the hero, the murderer, would be executed uh, step by step as men were in the gas chamber at that time. Very difficult film to cast because there was nobody to root for, really. Barbara Samwick, she was such an extraordinary actor, uh, signed on. None of the great male stars in the period wanted to touch the role of Walter Neff because it was so much about uh, a man who was simultaneously weak and evil. They would play evil, uh, they would play weak, they would not play weak and evil. So Fred McMurray, a very successful actor, but essentially a comedian, a comic actor, uh, got signed for the part and gives a sublime performance exactly because of that. And then Edgar G. Robinson, who had been a big star in gangster films throughout the 1930s, very shrewdly did the thing that all actors ought to do, and most do too late, which is to choose himself to make the transition from leading parts to character parts in the context of this film. You may remember Sean Connery was very smart about doing that back in the 1980s. And he put himself into secondary parts in order to extend his career. And Robinson, as I said, gives the most extraordinary performance for me in the film as the man who sense within it. I won't bore you with all the, the details of it, um, except to add that the, uh, the, the mise-en-scene, the camera work, is done by Joseph Seitz, um, who, is an who does an amazing job. And one of the most impressive things as you read about this film is to be aware that all the things that seem sort of serendipitous, the lighting, the particularization of the dust that falls uh, in the, uh, the seedy house where Walt, Fred McMurray encounters Barbara Stanley, the kind of what we think of now as the Venetian blind light, the way slats of light come through. None of these things were not only accidental, they were all carefully composed, much argued over, uh, designed. This is, though it has none of the kind of studied artiness of an Orson Welles film. I love Welles, but one is always aware of Welles composing. This is as carefully composed and orchestrated as any of the other great noir. And finally, uh, for me, it is blessed with the single finest uh, concluding lines, not just lines, but lines in all the film. And, and I include Nobody's Perfect, and um, um, for a minute there, I thought we were in trouble, and all of those wonderful zingers. Um, without giving anything away, uh, I hope, I just wanted to contemplate, reflect on those last lines just for a moment. Um, you remember that Walter Neff, the Fred McMurray character, says, no, I couldn't figure this one out, Keats, he says, talking to Richard Robinson, his companion in the insurance office. I'll tell you, because the guy you were looking for was too close, right across the desk from you. And Richard Robinson, Keyes says, closer than that, Walter. And then Neff says, I love you too. It's such a rich exchange, because what he's saying, obviously, is, um, I would have done exactly the same thing, given the same set of temptations. I could have done the same thing. It's closer than that. It wasn't you who were the killer. It was me, just as much vulnerable to it. It's a shattering moment. And for me, it's a key moment in understanding what the kind of hidden, the deep meaning, the deep allure of noir is. It's exactly the sense that in America in particular, it's always closer than that, that the line between criminality and honesty, the line between good and evil, our capacity to behave badly is always present. And also that uh, the divisions between the wholesome and the sinister are much less certain than we like them when we want them to be. This may seem far distant, but I've been brooding a lot with the 50th anniversary coming up and intending to write something about the Kennedy assassination, which is sort of the ultimate real life noir in American history. And what's really remarkable when you look at the, uh, at the JFK assassination is not that there necessarily was a conspiracy, I suspect that on the whole there was not, but exactly that all the parts of American life that you would have think would have been removed from each other, the Camelot of the White House and the seedy world of gangsters, the uh, intrigue in the Florida Everglades and Bobby Kennedy at the Justice Department, these things uh, that we thought were far apart were closer than that, were all part of one story. And that, I think, is finally the noir moral, the noir point. 
that what seem to us to be what we want to believe are the divorced worlds of good and evil, of temptation and integrity, are in fact always closer than that. And Fred McMurray's great comeback, I love you too, meaning that I recognize your absolution. I recognize that in those words, closer than that, you're uh, absolving me, understanding uh, what happened to me and why my life is ruined and I've done it. A great, great moment. Uh, and so economically, so without another word, let's all watch that one day.